Welcome back to the Data Digest. In this video, I want to show you the most important and helpful R functions for exploratory data analysis, EDA for short. These functions allow you to visualize, transform or manipulate, and describe or summarize your data. I will show you how to use the ggplot function and the associated geoms, which are necessary to point out certain patterns or relationships in the data and can be used to visualize the results of your analysis as well. I have many dedicated videos for these functions already in case you are interested in more detailed tutorials. Here are the functions that are helpful to transform and manipulate your data sets. And I again have a special video on the topic of reordering data, as well as some summary videos of EDA content. Describing and summarizing your data is very important. And for that, we will use the count, add count, group by, and summarize functions. I won't go into the statistics or prediction side of EDA much, only show a few examples of linear models, but there will be tutorials of these topics in the future, so make sure to subscribe subscribe to the channel. How do I know that these functions are the most important, you might ask? For now, I want you to trust me, but in the end of the video, I will show you why I selected these functions and where you can go to further advance your journey to become a better data analyst. I will cover these functions with four example data sets. Don't be intimidated by the amount of functions because they often work really well together. And if you master them, you will be able to analyze most of the data sets you come across. Let's get started with the R code. Let's start with the empty cars dataset. First, I remove every object from the R workspace and then I load some packages and I set the general theme to theme light. There are several ways how you can inspect the dataset. Head will give you the first six rows or first six cars and all the columns. The str or structure function tells you that there are 32 rows overall for 11 variables or columns. And then it tells you that all of the columns are numeric. Glimpse does the same, but a bit more organized because it spells out the rows and columns directly and with the view function you can open a separate tab and scroll through the data set. The summary function also provides some insights because it gives you the min max values, the mean median and the other two quartiles of each of the variables when they are numeric. For categories it would just count the number of entries and the problem with the cylinder category is that the average doesn't mean a lot when you have four six and eight cylinders you would rather want to see how many you have of each. When you have a zero and one coding like for AM which is the transmission either automatic for zero or manual for one then the mean gives you the proportion of manual transmission which is the average of zeros and ones, in this case indicating that 40.62% of the entries are ones or manual gear changes. Now if you want to know the number of cylinders in a data set, you could use count and it gives you the n of each category. You could sort it by decreasing n and then you would see that eight cylinders is most common relatively in the data set. And now let us explore the mileage a bit more, the M PG miles per gallon, how many miles do these cars drive with one gallon of gasoline? And for that, you could pipe the data set into the ggplot function and put the miles per gallon on the x-axis and follow up with a geomistogram to see the distribution of this variable. You could change the color of the histogram to black and increase the number of bins to increase the resolution a bit. And now you see what mileages are in the data set. And we want to try to predict which variables might influence this output variable. Let's try to look at the mileage on the y-axis with the different transmission types, automatic or manual on the x-axis, and follow up by a box plot and geom jitter. If you use it like this, you don't really get the results you're looking for because you would rather want to group by the transmission type, so getting two box plots and the mileages for automatic and the mileages for manual separated. Instead of using group, you could also use color. But now the problem is that it thinks these colors go from zero to one on a gradient and are not two separate categories. And to change that, you would use the factor function around the AM variable. And now it knows that these are two separate entities. And here would look like manual gear shift gives you a much bigger mileage and that cars with automatic transmission get fewer miles per gallon. Keep that in mind, uh, we will look into that later. And another variable we would look into to predict mileage would be the number of cylinders. Here again as factors to not get a gradient from six to eight, but three different categories. And here it looks like the more cylinders you have, the smaller your mileage gets. And the reason why I'm using geom jitter instead of geom points is that with geom points, you would get the points all exactly on the same number as the cylinders are and then they would overlap sometimes. When you plot the MPG versus the weight of the cars, you can see this relationship.
relationship or this trend that the heavier your, your car gets, the fewer miles you would be able to drive per gallon of gas. We could add a trend line with Geom Smooth and we can force this trend line to be linear by setting the method to LM. And then we get a straight line with a 95% confidence interval of the standard error predicting the average based on the number of observations you have. You can get rid of this standard error by setting it to false. And now I want to include the information of the transmission by keeping the color information as factor. So then Geom Point will color the points based on the AM variable and Geom Smooth will create two trend lines. And now you would ask, is knowing the transmission type beneficial to predict in the miles per gallon? When we look back, we saw that the automatic transmission had lower mileage, but now it looks like this is mostly based on cars with more weight have the automatic transmission and therefore smaller mileage. Let's look at the cylinders next. Here you would also get three different trend lines. And now it looks like knowing the cylinder actually matters because in this weight area, all cars have the same weight but different mileage. So it looks like having six cylinders instead of four will drop the mileage significantly and having two more cylinders will drop the mileage even more. And to figure that out, we will run a linear model. And it's really easy to do by simply predicting MPG based on weight with the empty cars data and then piping the linear model into the summary directly. And here you would see that knowing the weight already explains 75% of the variance that's associated with the miles per gallon. It's highly significant, both the slope and the intercept. With every increase of weight, you lose roughly five miles per gallon. And that's what this line represents. It has a slope of negative five. So we will be looking at the R squared value to judge whether our model improves by including more variables. And if you add the transmission to the model, you will notice that the variance explained hardly improves at all, which means that this model is not better than this overall model, which also makes sense from a mechanical point because on average people changing the gear will do it as good as automatic changes. Some will switch the gear early to save some gas, some will switch maybe too late to accelerate a little bit faster and use more gas. And you would also see that on the summary that the AM estimate is not significant. But this is different when it comes to cylinders. Here, the variance explained does increase, not much, but from 75% to 83%. And you would see that the cylinder term is significant. And with every cylinder you increase, your mileage goes down by minus 1.5. So in the plot, for the same weight, increasing by two cylinders, your mileage drops by three miles per gallon. And then increasing two more cylinders, you drop another three miles per gallon on average. Which makes sense because more cylinders, that's where the gas is burned and if you have more cylinders you have more horsepower and you need more gasoline to drive a mile and to make these kind of predictions and inferences that's where statistics comes into play that's where you have to understand linear models a bit better and then it's more of a second layer when it comes to data exploration but first it's good to look into different patterns based on different groups of variables for example when you would look into displacement or horsepower you would also see that more cylinders means bigger displacement of volume of the engine and then you also to have more horsepower. So all of these correlations you could look into by using the pairs function, which simply does a correlation of each variable with each other variable. So we looked into miles per gallon by weight and we had this correlation. An advanced version of the pairs function you get with the GGLA package, where you also get the distribution of the variable by itself and correlation coefficients. And here you have an advantage of even coloring this chart based on a variable. So now you get three different distributions based on cylinders and different correlation coefficients also separated for the various cylinder categories. Now I want to quickly show you how to visualize some results. The empty cars data set does not have a model name yet. The information is stored in the row names of the data frame, but you can simply extract it and put it into a new variable name called model or use the row names to column function on empty cars and providing the variable name. And now I want to plot the miles per gallon based on the different models and I use geom call to create a bar chart based on the mpg values. You have to use factor again but now don't use color but fill and to make the models more readable it's advised to just flip the chart and now what I want to do is order the different models by decreasing mileage and separate them into manual and automatic transmission. So the first thing you have to do is use the reorder within function from the tidy text package and create a new variable called model underscore am where we sort the model name or reorder them based on the miles per gallon within each am category. So create an order for 
automatic and an order for manual. And now you have the new model name with these indicators of whether it's manual or automatic transmission. And the next thing we would do is follow up with a facet wrap to separate out these categories. And in order to avoid this empty space, we would set the scales to free Y axis. And now a little bit cleaning up the scale X reorder function gets rid of the underscore naming. Then we don't need this legend anymore and we can use legend position equals none within the theme function and erase the y-axis label, which is originally the x-axis, but we used coordinate flip, so x and y is changed. And now you would know that if you need a car with automatic transmission that has a relatively high mileage, you would go for these cars. But if you want to get extra mileage, then you would pick a car with manual transmission and choose from these top car models. Another reason why starting with plotting your data is a good idea is to visualize differences from normal distributions. The Gapminder data shows life expectancy and GDP per capita for the different countries of various continents from 1952 to 2007. And you can see that there are many countries that are below $5,000 per year. And in some countries, it go into 30, 40, and 50,000. And one solution would be to use log 10 transformation on the GDP per capita within the ggplot function and the aesthetics mapping. So now it looks a bit more like a linear relationship. But I prefer to do this transformation with the scale x log function and not within ggplot. Because here you can also change the label of the x-axis and change it into the dollar label. So now you can see better which countries are below $1,000, $3,000 and then ten. We can of course include another variable like continent for color information in this plot. And now you see that there's a big difference between Africa and Europe when it comes to life expectancy and GDP per capita with Asia and the American countries in between. And whenever you have a lot of overlapping points it might be a good idea to use facet wrap to split out the information into four different plots. Now it's going to be four because I exclude Oceania, which is just Australia and New Zealand within the filter function. And now you can see each continent individually. So now the next thing you would do is exclude the legend because the information of the continent is in the title of the chart. You do this again with theme legend position equals none. And now what you might want to do to see a bit more of the details within each continent is to free up the x and y axis because now they are fixed to be identical going from 40 to 80 years even though in Europe no country is below 70 years life expectancy and you do that within the facet wrap function by setting the scale argument to free and now each continent has its own scales that allow for the maximum spread of the data points. You would be able to include the name of the country by mapping it to the country variable within the ggplot function. So just use label equals country and then add the geom text function to the plot. Set color to black text and the size to 3 and you will get this plot where many of the country names overlap. There's one way to fix this, changing geom text to geom text repel with the gg repel package. And now we'll not label every point when there's too much concentration within a certain area. And it will also introduce lines and make the country names repel from one another. So that's a quick way to explore the differences between continents or within continents and find the richest countries and the one with the highest life expectancy, at least according to 2007 data. Now I want to explore the change of life expectancy over time, so using the year variable from 1952 to 2007. And if you just try to map this and use GeomLine, you get a really weird pattern because there are multiple countries for each year with a different life expectancy. You can try to group by continent, but now you get five lines of these weird patterns. So what you would have to do is group by individual country, but you can color it based on continent. So now you have one line per country and the color coding for the different continents. But to get an idea of the overall trend per continent, you can do some calculations. For example, group by continent in year and then calculate the average, either the mean life expectancy or the median life expectancy. So now for Africa 1952 to 2007, you have mean and median life expectancies. And you can see the change. And it seems like median and mean are very similar. Not many outliers influencing this overall trend. So we can decide on only using 
using one within the plotting, like the average life expectancy that was calculated within a summarized function using the mean life expectancy. And now we don't have to group by anything because for every combination of year and continent, there's just one entry of average life expectancy. And we can use this grouping information within the color of the aesthetics mapping within ggplot and get five lines showing the change in life expectancy over time for the five different continents. When you look at the legend, you will notice that it comes out alphabetically and not in the order of the continents according to life expectancy. So what you have to do if you want to get the legend in the exact order of your plot, after you summarize the results, you see that continent is a factor with these alphabetical levels. You have to ungroup this results table and then mutate to change continent into a different factor with the FCT reorder function where you now change continent into the order of average life expectancy. So if you run this code you again get continent as a factor but last value now comes in the order that's not alphabetical anymore but goes from Africa to Asia and not from Africa to Americas. So this plot is now perfectly aligned with the legend. If you want to add some more details to this change over time you can use box plots and geomjitter to see how these different continents played out over the years but now you would notice if you put continents on the x-axis and use facet wrap based on year it's not too easy to see the trend so you would switch that and now use facet wrap on continent and include year as factor on the x-axis and now it becomes a bit more obvious how this continent changed over the years and that sometimes you see a few countries lagging behind in certain continents or that there's overall a saturation when it comes to life expectancy but now this might be a bit too much detail because you have two entries per decade and we can reduce the box plots to half by using the mutate function so now we redo this plot not based on year but the decade information so imagine you have the sequence 90 52 to 1972 what the modulo function does is dividing this sequence by modulo 10 it will get rid of the last digit because it tells you how often you can multiply 10 by this number to fit in here and then having a rest of 2 that you cannot divide by 10 anymore so if you multiply this by 10 you get a decade information everything that's 9052 to 59 becomes just the decade 9050 and if we count this grouping you see now you have two entries per decade and based on this grouping we can build the average life expectancy based on these two observations within each decade. So now you have a life expectancy for each decade for the different countries. If you want to use this result for the plotting, you have to include one more grouping variable, which is the continent. It won't change anything on the calculations, but it will keep the information next to the country, decade and life expectancy variables. And now you can use this continent information for the color coding and for facet wrap. And now all you have to do in the plot is change change year to decade in the aesthetics mapping and you get a cleaner plot of the change over time. And one useful function to improve on the charts even more is the lapse function where you can get rid of the current x-axis label by using empty quotes and you can change the subtitle in the y-axis label and include some caption text to produce a chart like this. The next function I want to show you is the add count function. If you group a data set based on a certain variable and then follow up with add count, it will show you how often this variable is present in the data set. So we filtered for the year 2007, but within each year there are 33 continents for Asia and 30 for Europe. And it doesn't matter which country you choose from a continent, it will always be 33 because the continent is what we grouped on. So Australia, Oceania is just two and the other one would be New Zealand. So what is this information good for? You could add a weighting to this add count function to summarize the population of the continent. So now it won't tell you how many observations you have from each continent, but it will add up the population from each country within the continent grouping, and then it will replicate this. So for Africa, you have 930 million over a population. And this information is now kept for Algeria and Angola because they're both from Africa. And what we can do here, we can first change the name from N to continent population 
population and we can calculate the percent continent for each country based on the country population divided by the continent population and then a range in descending percentage. And this would quickly give you the information that in this data set Australia is 83% population wise of Oceania, China with 2007 data 1.3 billion population is 34% of Asia followed by India 29% etc. You could use the top n function to only get the top four countries of each continent and you can use this result to produce a chart like this. All of these functions we've seen before so within a mutate you do the reorder within to get the top 10 countries from the four different continents excluding Oceania based on overall population. We add geom text again after using the bar chart geom call function using coordinate flip scale x reordered and then facet wrap based on continent and now you would see population wise Asia is very skewed towards China and India at least in 2007 and America United States have a third of the whole population followed by Brazil Mexico Colombia and in Africa you have Nigeria on top followed by Egypt and Ethiopia. Next I want to explore the movie profit dataset. It contains over 3000 movies and 8 variables, one of them being the production budget. And if you plot the production budget with a geom histogram, you can see that again it's not normally distributed, but follow this right leaning skew. So it's advised again to use the scale x log 10 function, where you can also include the dollar format as a label. And now it looks more normally distributed with many movies being around 10 million and 50 million in production, only a few above 100 million and then some movies around 1 to 5 million. Now I want to introduce the FCT lump function. Why would we need that? If you look at the distributors of these movies and you count them, you see that you have over 200 entries. You can set sort to true and then you see the top distributors have over 100 movies in the data set. The count function also shows you movies without a distributor where it's NA. You could always ask directly if the distributor of a movie is NA and then get trues and false or you can add up the trues with the sum function to get 48. So we want to filter out the entries with production budget but no distributor and if I use geombox plot you would get this plot that doesn't mean anything so it's first advice to add corded flip now you at least get an idea that there are many different distributors and the box plot of their production values but what we want to do is group all of them together and only show for example the top 10 and group the rest in other which the fct lump function would do for us so first we would use mutate to create a reordered version of this with the fct reordered function distributors now have a level according to the production budget so you can see the median production budget decreases from top to bottom we use the dollar format on the y-axis and with coordinate flip it became the x-axis. Now we will use the fct lump function. So the fct lump function would keep the top n distributors and group everything past that into an other category. So if you run this code up until here and then look at the table of the last value distributors you now see the distributors with the most movies and then there are over a thousand movies now grouped into the other category. And if we plot this you can see the top 10 distributors and then the production budget box plot of the rest. Very useful function when it comes to a data set that has many categories. So now you could also include the genre information, use that as a fill and use facet wrap distributors after using the FCT lump function again on 8 to create a chart where you would see the production budgets for the top 8 distributors plus others. So now you could detect patterns where maybe MGM spends more money on action movies compared to the other genre. Paramount Pictures spends very little on horror movies. Disney doesn't produce horror movies at all, it seems. So these lumping functions and facet wrap and color coding different variables are really good tools to get an overview over certain patterns in your data. I have a dedicated video on these movie profits where I looked into other variables as well. And I will link to this video in the description down below in case you want to check out some more cool charts. Now the last example will be based on a diamonds data set that's over 50,000 entries of diamonds with different color, clarity, cut and weight and then of course the price associated with that. You can use the summarize function to calculate the min, median, mean and max price and then also see the n. If you include a categorical variable within a group by you will get the individual results for the different cut levels. So now you see the min and max, mean and median prices based on the different number of observations 
operations within each cut. So these n numbers correspond to what you would get if you just count the cut of diamonds. And you could even group by two variables, but then I suggest to limit the result to only one summary statistic. So now there are multiple combinations of clarity, which comes in eight different ordered levels from worst to most clear. And now you see, of course, that uh, sample size decreases, but you can still calculate the average price based on this n number. You wouldn't be able to see all of the calculated results in this preview, but with pivot wider, you can calculate the average price and summarize for cut and clarity groupings and then spread out the different cut names to the columns so with names from you decide what the column names are going to be so now it's cut the values come from average price and now you could see that all the different average prices for clarity as rows and cut as columns there is a way to visualize this with the geom tile function and adding the geom text for the label i use the dollar function making the text white makes it a bit easier to read the price and now you might wonder Shouldn't there be a clearer pattern where with the better cut and the better clarity, the price should increase on average? And there's a slight tendency to see that, that usually the more you go down or to the right, it becomes brighter, so higher prices. But we will now investigate this a little bit further. Because when it comes to price, of course, the weight of the diamond has a huge influence. And now I plotted 53,000 dots with the different cut information as color. And now I want to add the geom smooth, which confirms this trend of higher weight, higher prices. And now I want to know if the cut gives us additional information towards predicting the price based on weight. I will also filter out any diamond that's above three because there's not much data there and we would get a better resolution on these dots. But I will drop the geom point function and just look at the geom smooth, which will now be created for all the five different cuts. And here you can see the trend that up until a weight of one caret, the lines are very similar, but then towards 1.5, you can see that fair and good cut clearly produces lower prices and the yellow line for ideal is always on top. And then when it comes to two carat, the differentiation decreases and the prices on average become quite similar. So then the weight becomes more important again. And here I used guides color reverse again to put ideal on top and fair on the bottom and changed the background to theme gray. Now you could do the same for clarity to investigate the influence of the clarity of the diamonds and you would see a similar pattern that the more clear the diamond is the higher price you would get especially after one carat up to 1.5 and 2 and that the lowest clarity produces way smaller prices and with facet wrap you could include another variable to look for these trends for clarity differences within four different cuts. I excluded fair because there was not enough data to produce these lines but overall they look quite similar. So originally I came across this tweet that showed the most used R functions from David Robinson's Tidy Tuesday screencasts. And in this video, I covered most of them. And David Robinson is a YouTuber that does these screencasts where he spends one hour analyzing data sets he has not seen before. So doing exploratory data analysis, and he's really good at this. So learning from the best will give you a head start with your own analysis. He also won the sliced competition, so I recommend to subscribe to his channel to learn more about machine learning and predicting and modeling. And there are people on GitHub that keep track of all the functions that are used in his screencasts and annotate them even to a point where you have timestamps of when the function was used and in which context and from which package the function comes from, etc. There was also an article published on R bloggers that showed the most used packages that were used for the Tidy Tuesday project and then went into which functions of each package were the most used. So I will link to this blog as well and you can get familiar with more functions that are useful for exploratory data analysis. And as I mentioned on my channel I have a playlist explaining more R functions as well as tutorials on visualizations where I go into detail on many of the different geom functions. So feel free to check these out as well. Until next time here at the Data Digest. Bye bye.